Vacations are normally a time when you enjoy well-earned comforts and take the time to just lay back, sip a few choice beverages, and let the world melt away. They should never turn into an experience where you have to fear for your life or, in the case of the couple in today's episode, pay with it. After a beautiful day diving, they would surface only to discover that they had been abandoned 60 kilometers from shore in the midst of an area stalked by sharks known to attack humans. Their story would inspire a Hollywood film and the resulting trial of those responsible would spark diving reform in Australia. I'm Nick and this is chapter 25 of the Insidious Agenda podcast titled Please Help Us or We Will Die. The Disappearance of Tom and Eileen Lonergan Young, idealistic, and in love, this is how relatives of Thomas Lonergan and Eileen Haynes would describe the couple. Tom was 57, born on the 28th of December in 1964. Eileen was 53, born on the 3rd of March in 1969. They were from Baton Rouge, a city in the state of Louisiana. They both obtained degrees from Louisiana State University. Tom and Eileen met while at LSU, fell in love, and were married in Jefferson, Texas on the 24th of June in 1988. Initially, the couple were teachers, but joined the Peace Corps to serve on the island nations of Fiji and Tuvalu. While stationed there, Eileen continued with her hobby of scuba diving, which she was proclaimed to be very experienced and very proficient at. It was here she encouraged Tom to take up the sport as well. After a three-year tour of duty, the couple were on their way back to the continental United States with one stop along the way. Tom and Eileen couldn't pass up the opportunity of a lifetime to dive the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. They prepared to join a charter and would stop in Queensland. Their intention was to dive an area known as St. Crispin's Reef, an area along the outer shelf of the larger reef network. The couple purchased their tickets for the sum of only $160 in Port Douglas. This was a town meant to cater more to well-off tourists, hoping to spend some money there. On the 25th of January, 1998, they boarded a dive boat known as the Motor Vessel Outer Edge, a 12-meter boat in Port Douglas, along with 24 other passengers and staff under the watch of the ship's skipper, Jeffrey Nairn, who often goes by Jack. The dive site was approximately 60 kilometers off the coast. When coming on station, the occupants of the ship would conduct dives at three separate sites. Tom and Eileen were in the third group, and would dive in an area known as Fish City, owing to its abundance of sea life. Tom and Eileen, being the experienced divers they were, informed one of the crew members that they were going to go off on their own. It was later discovered that this request was not recorded in the ship's dive log. The employee was dive master Catherine Traverso, who would later state they wanted to go off and do their own thing. The last time Tom and Eileen were ever seen, they were described as swimming away calmly. A great amount of enjoyment was had by all. For the diving enthusiasts, it was a chance to dive one of the greatest and most beautiful areas they could ever imagine. For those just happy to take part, it was an opportunity to see one of the most beautiful sights our pale blue dot has to offer. When the diving activities concluded for the day, the skipper and his staff conducted a head count that appeared to be correct and set sail for home. The only issue was, the count wasn't correct. 
they had left Tom and Eileen behind, adrift in the open water. Not only were they abandoned, but abandoned in one of the worst places imaginable, the shark-infested waters of the Great Barrier Reef. Tom and Eileen had been part of the third and last crew of divers. They were most likely underwater for less than an hour. After their amazing dive, they would have surfaced to the clear blue sky, calm water, and feel a sense of instant dread and the crushing, sinking feeling knowing they were alone. There are, of course, a number of factors that could have contributed to this unfortunate avoidable tragedy. Weather hadn't really been a contributing factor, as the day was reported as calm and clear. The depth they were diving, approximately 12 meters, wasn't outside the realm for the dive of this type. The majority of responsibility for this has to fall on the skipper, as they are usually the sole individual ultimately responsible for ensuring the safety of all passengers and crew. Not only does he share the blame, but every other member of that trip shoulders it, whether they be staff or participant. Tom and Eileen must have talked to someone that could place them. Either way, the ship pulled away and left them to their fate. In all honesty, we'll never know what really happened to Tom and Eileen, but the possibilities are few. Though neither is light in nature, the more palatable of the two is that they drowned. They had no life rafts, belts, or flotation gear of any kind. After ditching their scuba tanks, they would have eventually tired out and drowned. The environmental factors also would have played a major role. The couple were diving in the scorching heat of the summer in Australia. In addition, they had no food or potable water. The second is the more grim version of what may have happened, that they were attacked and eviscerated by sharks. The coast off Queensland is well known for playing host to a myriad of sharks. Some of the most common and most lethal are tiger sharks. These, on average in this area, can measure to be about five feet in length and bear the reputation of being the most likely to attack humans. Whichever explanation is true, Tom and Eileen Lonergan were never seen again. Not seen alive, or recovered from the ocean, but to this day, their bodies have never been found. The shuttle that was supposed to take them back to their hostel in Cairns arrived as it was supposed to, intending to pick up the Lonergans, and potentially some other divers. The driver, Norman Stigand, went into the BTS bus company office around 5.30 or 6 and stated to the owner, Corinne, Anne, Char, and Guivel, that Tom and Eileen weren't there waiting for him when he arrived at the wharf. He took a look around some local shops, the ice cream shop, the coffee shop, the local hotel, but he couldn't find any sight of them. Corinne, then alleged to have contacted the outer edge owner, Tom Colrain. When queried about the discussion later, she couldn't remember any specifics of their conversation. But she did clarify that the response she got back was that it was okay for the driver to leave without Tom and Eileen. The day after the Lonigans were left behind, the motor vessel Outer Edge returned to the dive area with new passengers. There was no sign of Tom or Eileen. However, the skipper didn't actually know they were missing. During this day, a set of dive weights was recovered from the site, which the staff simply chalked up to being a bonus find. On the second day since the dive, Jack Nair noticed something peculiar on his boat, that a bag was left behind. The bag was also reported to have been noticed by a crew member the evening of Tom and Eileen's dive, but was simply moved to a different part of the boat, believing someone had just left it behind. It was filled with the personal belongings of Tom and Eileen. Personal items, wallets, and passports all contained therein. This is not a find he took lightly. 
I looked in the bag and thought, Jesus Christ, it's got a wallet and papers in it. Nairn also noticed the dry clothes that were supposed to be worn by Tom and Eileen were still aboard, even recognizing the shirt that Tom wore that day. Jack's first call was to the hostel that the couple were staying at. When he was informed, they hadn't returned. In addition, it was discovered Tom and Eileen had left their shoes at the dive shop, and they were still unclaimed. Only then were the alarm bells sounded. Nairn would contact the local police, at this point 51 hours after the ship left the reef. The police began to prepare for the search. They would enlist the aid of the Royal Australian Navy, using both air and sea-based assets. Even other civilian vessels would assist. The search was underway on the 28th of January. 17 aircraft, two helicopters, and innumerable boats took part in the search. Overall, the search area covered 3,200 square nautical miles of both sea and coastline. After an extensive three-day search, no trace of Tom or Eileen was found. The police determined that the couple were likely carried away by currents. They also made note that the nearby coastlines and even the ocean had large amounts of debris present brought on by landfall of recent cyclones. This, of course, made finding any intricate and small pieces of evidence very difficult. The search was called off, officially, on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day. A bit situationally ironic, in retrospect. The coroner, Noel Noonan, having nothing to go on, could only conclude that their presumed deaths were caused by exposure, drowning, or by shark attack. Noonan did launch an inquisition which turned up multiple stories and accounts for what happened that day. These findings will be dispersed through this episode. Nothing would turn up for quite some time. Over the course of the next few weeks, some of the dive gear began to wash up on shore. The first was Eileen's wetsuit, a green and grey color, in early February, about a month after they went missing. The wetsuit was covered in barnacles and showed tears on the bottom and the armpit, which were attributed to coral catching the material and tearing it. The public, of course, wouldn't buy into this explanation. For them... It was caused by sharks. Following the wetsuit, other items would begin to wash up in Port Douglas. Tom's buoyancy compensator washed up on shore on the 5th of February, about 120 kilometers from the dive site. That June, dive belts showing Tom and Eileen's names, air tanks, and even one of Eileen's flippers would all come ashore. One thing that may have been a bit of a solace to their families was that none of the items washed ashore showed any signs of damage. Thus, rendering it highly unlikely that their lives came to a gruesome, violent end. While the police investigated the couple's disappearance, another skipper with an interesting story came forward. He claimed to have visited the dive site the day after the Lonigans were abandoned, bringing a charter full of guests. When conducting a headcount, the return trip came in at two higher than they had departed with. The skipper stated that all of his guests were Italian, but he recalled hearing some American voices amongst the tourists. Is it possible that the Lonergans boarded the boat alongside the others? Although it's interesting to speculate, this is not very likely. It would have meant that Tom and Eileen intended to spend the night in shark-infested waters waiting for another dive boat to come by that they had no idea would ever come. Even more curious is that if the boat left Port Douglas with one amount and was heading back with another, why wouldn't that boat skipper figure it out then and there? It all remains to be seen. Several months after Tom and Eileen's disappearance, a crucial piece of the puzzle was found by a fisherman local to the area. He found a dive slate, 100 miles from where the Lonergans were abandoned. For those who are unaware, dive slates 
are small boards carried by most divers. They're used to write messages to one another or for recording information. The slate that was discovered was extremely well worn, but the following could be made out. Monday, Jan 26, 1998, 8 a.m. To anyone who can help us, we have been abandoned on Agincourt Reef by MV Outer Edge, 25 Jan 98, 3 p.m. Please help us. Come to rescue us before we die. Help. The only thing that could be discerned from this finding was that the couple had survived at least overnight into the following day. Like any unsolved case, many new explanations, some reasonable and some not, began to surface. One that might make sense was the idea that the Lonergans chose to stay behind and that it was a plot of a murder-suicide. Shortly after their disappearance, their bags were taken from the hostel they were staying at. In these bags were Tom and Eileen's private journals. Six months before their trip home, Tom made the following entry. Like a student who has finished an exam, I feel that my life is complete and I am ready to die. As far as I can tell, from here, my life can only get worse. It has peaked and it's all downhill from here until my funeral. One of Eileen's entries would only confirm that he didn't hide this from her. On the 9th of January in 1998, she would write, Tom hopes to die a quick and painly death, and he hopes it happens soon. Tom's not suicidal, but he's got a death wish that could lead him to what he desires, and I could get caught in that. Our lives are so entwined now that we are hardly two individuals. Where we are now goes beyond dependence, beyond love. This explanation for what happened is plausible. Tom may have requested the stop to do the dive and decided he would succumb to the elements. While Eileen, as she believed she would, got caught up in his death wish. This wasn't widely accepted and the whole ordeal was chalked up to coincidence. Another possibility in the realm of a planned disappearance was that they actually meant to disappear. They planned to be left behind, possibly being picked up by another boat passing through the area, looking to escape somewhere and start a new life. We know from Tom's journal that he had enough of the life he was living and may have sought out a new purpose. However, the Lonergan's bank accounts remained untouched and their life insurance policies were never collected on. Also from Mylene's journal, she had agreed to remain with Tom no matter what the outcome would be. The friends and family members of Tom and Eileen said that the diaries were taken out of context with the coroner supporting this. Noonan stated that only the pages which supported the suicide theory were ever made public and that there was a great amount of entries that went against it. The only people who have ever read the non-leaked versions of the journals are Noonan, the Port Douglas police, and the Haynes family. The expert speculation was such that the Lonigans weren't eaten by sharks, but rather developed delirium from dehydration. This would have caused them to remove their dive gear and wetsuits. Due to the lack of buoyancy, they would have become overexhausted and drowned. The coroner was the one to finally lay blame. He dismissed the theories of a suicide plot and the faking of a disappearance before formally charging Jeffrey Nairn with manslaughter. Noonan would state, The skipper should be vigilant for the safety of passengers and ensure safety measures are carried out. When you combine the number of mistakes and the severity of the mistakes, I am satisfied that a reasonable jury would find Mr. Nairn guilty of manslaughter on criminal evidence. At the trial, which began on the 8th of November, the defense had presented nine witnesses who claimed to have seen the Lonergans within days of their disappearance. It was entirely possible, due to the media firestorm that followed the trial, showing various pictures of the couple which would have made them recognizable. The prosecution 
was founded on the idea of the couple suffering from the attacks of sharks. Defense counsel Graham Houston shocked the entire courtroom when he suggested that the disappearance was the carrying out of a double suicide or even a murder homicide with Tom having killed Eileen before ending his own life. He would point to many depressing and melancholy passages contained in the recovered journals. Eileen's father, John Haynes, had the following to say about Houston's suggestion. The defense attorney used these diaries to absolutely slander and to absolutely destroy these two people's reputations. When Jack Nairn testified, he relayed that he was a new owner of the boat and had delegated responsibility for diver safety to the crew that he had inherited with the purchase of the ship. Nonetheless, as the boat's captain, he took responsibility for leaving them behind. He did, however, lay blame for the failed headcount on his dive masters, George Prehow and Kathy Traverso. They were the ones that informed him all souls were accounted for. It was discovered that the headcount was messed up when two passengers jumped back in the water. As the count had already been down two people, when these came back on board, they were assumed to be the missing two. It's possible that the responsibility for the count may have been passed to someone else by Prehow or Traverso, and that individual may have not been experienced enough to fulfill that duty. Prehow would contradict Nairn's story, saying that he did inform the skipper only 24 of 26 were accounted for. He said that the two swimmers were still in the water. Nairn vehemently denied this, stating he would have asked for a recount if there were any discrepancy. The trial would conclude with no justice being served. Nairn was found not guilty of the unlawful killing to which he was charged. John Haynes would again say, I was disappointed in the verdict. I felt like the story didn't believe that they were dead, and to me that was the essence of the trial, to prove that they had died. Unfortunately for Nairn, his company, Outer Edge Dive, was found guilty of negligence in the Australian Civil Court and paid a heavy fine to the tune of $27,000. The fine drained the coffers of his company and forced them into bankruptcy and eventually out of business. The public, however, was not satisfied. They believed justice hadn't been served and not sentencing those clearly responsible was a huge mistake. What the trial did accomplish, however, was getting the state of Queensland to review issued regulations for dive operations within their area of responsibility. All operators of dive businesses are now instructed on how to properly conduct headcounts, maintain lookouts, and give advice to all divers about the strenuous nature of diving and snorkeling with respect to medical conditions. For headcounts, all passengers are now required to be back on boat, doors closed, and everyone seated. Captains and dive masters must conduct individual counts and compare them against one another. In an interview done with Michael McFadden Scuba, one of the passengers on the same charter as Tom and Eileen, uh, Mr. Richard Triggs, stated that he was incredibly critical of the safety features conducted by the crew of the Outer Edge and felt that both he and his wife's safety were in jeopardy that day. He testified during the initial inquest about this, even going so far as to state everything about the headcount issue was an error, as, to his best recollection, no headcount ever took place at all. All of this was of course contradicting earlier reports, as Triggs made comments in an article written in 1998 stating that Outer Edge was the best tour operator he had ever seen. To this day, John Haynes misses his daughter dearly, but harbors no ill will toward the crew and passengers of the Outer Edge. I don't have any hard feelings against anybody, because it was an accident. It leaves a big hole in you to lose your kid. That's part of your life. I wish they had found them, so we had something, I suppose we have the Great Barrier Reef. They're part of that. Speaking to the people Tom and Eileen were, 
Mike Jones, a mutual friend, would say, In the ridiculousness of what has followed, no one has spoken of the lives they lived, the people whose lives they changed forever. Tom and Eileen should be honored and praised for the life they lived, not coldly depicted for their tragic end. The true tragedy is what has happened since they were abandoned. To the parents, family, and friends of Tom and Eileen, I offer my deepest sympathies. Though they died far too early, they died as heroes. They answered the call of service, and they helped untold numbers of people. The story of Tom and Eileen loosely influenced the 2003 movie Open Water. Though the conditions are similar, in the sense that the main characters are left behind due to an inaccurate headcount, the film is set in the Caribbean. And, and this isn't spoiling it because it's been out for almost 20 years, the couple in the end would succumb to a vicious shark attack, choosing to go in that direction of what might have happened to the Lonergans. There are many directions in which you can draw your own conclusion, and it really does become a choose-your-own ending. There is no way to truly confirm what happened to Tom and Eileen as everything is purely founded in speculation. The blame rests solely upon the skipper and the crew who above all others are charged with passenger safety. But amongst it all, is there truth to the double suicide or the murder homicide theory? Based on the journals, it's possible, but we'll never know. If the worst is to be believed that they died, the sympathetic side of us all hopes that they did get dehydrated, become delirious, and drown. But the possibility will always exist that it was something beyond their control, something that lurks in the open water. This concludes the tragic story of Tom and Eileen Lonergan, two avid lovers of diving who set off on a well-deserved adventure and were never seen again. I really hoped you enjoyed listening to this story. It really offers the opportunity to draw your own conclusions. Before you go, remember to hit the subscribe button and leave us a quick review on whichever podcast service you're listening from. If you're listening on YouTube today, don't forget to hit the thumbs up if you like the episode and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of the amazing stories next year. Like next Tuesday, the first chapter of 2023, when we'll discuss the interwoven urban legends of the Mothman and the curious case of the entity known as Indrid Cold. Also, don't forget to come back this Saturday for our year in review episode, where I'll go over my top 10 moments from the first year of this podcast and give out our inaugural awards, The Insidious. New episodes release every Tuesday at 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But for now, it's time to close the cover of The Insidious Agenda. I'll see you again next week. And thank you for choosing to come back and listen. Stay spooky.